asking who'll be listening, but we're going to go over forgiveness. So listen to the parable and what it teaches and the importance that <clears throat> we forgive <clears throat> as God has forgiven us. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the reckoning, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, and he could not pay. His Lord ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But that same servant, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and besought him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison till he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you besought me. And should you not have mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, the Lord delivered him to the jailers till he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Let us pray. Lord God, we do thank you for the word that you give to us and the teaching that it provides. May your word penetrate deeply into our hearts and control our lives. And now, Lord, as we reflect upon that word, may your spirit guide, and through the imperfect human word, may your divine word be heard. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It really is a great joy to be with you all today, to be able to share this time with you and to see so many faces that are familiar from years past and from our time together. This is one of the joys of retirement. You get to go around and do this kind of thing instead of saying, I'm already claimed on a Sunday. So um, we am going to enjoy this moment. Now, in retirement, I have been doing a good bit of writing on a host of topics, most of which is of little interest to anyone but me. A good friend who is required to read my writing, required because, well, he's a good friend, recently asked me to write an essay on manners and civility. Cover everything, he said, from writing thank you notes to speaking kindly, to trying to get along. I've not yet done so. But I understand his request, the frustration that he feels, the desire to have something written. It is because we are in a very uncivil time. Social media of all ilks has made it possible to immediately post whatever comes to our minds before there is perhaps time to think or to calm down. It's also made possible an amenity so that people can speak without having to own their words. Politics and religion have deeply divided people. And somehow, somehow we've gotten it into our minds that it is acceptable to demonize those who think differently. Consequently, angry, hurtful, mean-spirited words are spoken, written, and posted on a daily basis. 
and the toll is great. We're seeing friendships ending, neighbors at odds with each other, churches in turmoil, even families dividing. The breach in relationships is wide and feels as wide as ever. And perhaps it is. What it is not is new. Relationships have been the victims of incivility since the beginning of time. Remember, the first family was barely out of the garden before Cain murdered his brother, Abel. This struggle with relationships, this, this problem with people getting along, is evident in all of Paul's writings, in all of the letters that he wrote to, to each of his new churches. He had to spend considerable time writing about how to get along. People with really nothing in common except the common belief in Christ were constantly bickering and degrading each other. Paul was forced into the position of being peacekeeper, peacemaker. And he counseled better attitudes and better behavior. Our lesson from Colossians this morning is a good example. In the lesson, Paul first reminds the people of Colossae that they are God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. So right away, he reminds them that they are called to a different standard. Look, he says, you are God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. As such, as such, clothe yourselves with compassion, Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Paul was making it clear that these are the attributes and the attitudes that should guide the thoughts, words, and actions of every Christian. It doesn't matter your politics. It doesn't matter your religious doctrinal preferences. Believers are to be compassionate and kind, humble, Peaceful, patient. It just dawned on me that I can tell my friend I don't have to write an essay on civility. He can just read Colossians 3.12. See, if believers would follow just this teaching, just this teaching, a ton of relationships would be far better. But Paul didn't stop there. There was more to say. He went on, bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. So you must also forgive. Hmm. That's the part I want to spend some extra time on this morning because forgiveness is central to relationship. The most important way to breach the breach is with forgiveness and the other side of that coin, repentance. We see this throughout the New Testament, really. Jesus and Paul and John specifically talked often about forgiveness, just how important it is and how, how central it is to keeping good relationships. And not as a static, one-time happening, but as an ongoing dynamic. This is clear in our gospel lesson today when, when Peter asked about how many times he has to forgive. You see, Peter had gotten the memo already that we're supposed to forgive. And, and he was down with that. But Peter thought that this was a command that should come with a limit. And so he asked Jesus, Lord, 
if a number member of the church sins against me, how often do I have to forgive? As many as seven times? Undoubtedly, Peter thought that he was being gracious and generous by suggesting seven. He probably thought three at the max. Jesus, though, said, no, no, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, <clears throat> don't program your Apple watches with a forgiveness counter so that when you hit 77, you can stop forgiving. Jesus was not being literal. He was telling us that there is no limit. Constant, ongoing forgiveness is part of relationship keeping. <clears throat> the Bible is clear on this. The gospel is clear on this. We are to forgive. We are commanded to forgive. We don't just forgive because we have to, though. It's equally important to forgive because it is the primary way to breach the breach, to heal relationships. And besides that, it is good for us, as good for us as it is for those we forgive. That's right, forgiving others is as good for us as it is for those we forgive. I, I know in my life, I've had times when I have been hurt and have felt angry and resentful. Haven't we all? And for me, that sometimes starts a process. It starts with my replaying the offense over and over in my mind. And the thing is, every time I review it, it gets worse. And I get angrier. And then sometimes I have trouble sleeping, sometimes can be in a foul mood for days on end. And then somewhere in that process, it finally dawns on me that I am only hurting myself. The person who offended may not even know that I've been hurt or that they have done anything. My bitterness is not causing them any trouble at all. I'm the only one struggling. And, and that's when I finally pray and ask God to soften my heart, to allow me to forgive and to let go. I suspect I'm not alone in that. It helps us. I read a sermon that included an illustration that, that speaks to this point. A professor was teaching a class on relationships. And the first part of that was going to be on forgiveness. So the first day of class, he showed up with lots of big plastic bags, some markers, and boxes of tomatoes. And he told the students, I want each of you to take a tomato for every person who is in need of your forgiveness, every person who's hurt you, and you're, and you're thinking about that. If it's a small thing, take a cherry tomato. If it's a little bigger, a regular tomato. If it's a big deal, take a beefsteak tomato. So they gathered their tomatoes, and, and then he says, now I want you to write on each tomato the name of the person and the offense. When he'd done that, he had them then bag their tomatoes. And, and when all the students had all their tomatoes bagged, he says, now this is your assignment. Carry this bag with you wherever you go. You can put it in a backpack if you must, but I prefer you carry it. Sleep with it, eat with it, take it everywhere. If I see you in town, if I see you on campus, if I see you anywhere without it, I will mark you down. Well, the first week, a few got marked down, but most took the assignment seriously and faithfully had their bag of tomatoes with them. And the second week, they were starting to mumble. This is awkward and a pain. The third week, they were starting to complain. The tomatoes are getting drippy and runny and gross. By the fourth week, they were in outright rebellion. These tomatoes are starting to get moldy and they stink. We can't sleep with them because the smell is so bad. Nobody wants to be around us. I see, said the professor. Now maybe you're ready to get the point. When you carry around resentments and grudges, it's awkward and a pain. 
in short order, they become runny and drippy and gross. And at some point, they start to stink. And nobody wants to be around you. And you don't even want to be around yourself. If you are ready to forgive, then take your tomatoes outside and put them out on the ground. Oh, and by the way, when you put your tomatoes out, they will help new life spring up. Well, the professor was correct. When we forgive, we enable new life to spring up. We forgive not just because we are commanded to, but we forgive because it is good for us, it helps us, and we forgive because it is the way to breach the breach, to heal and restore relationships. Forgiveness is central. Now, there's a lot more to say about forgiveness, but I, I want to switch directions so I have time to talk about the other side of the coin, repentance. Three words that should come quickly to every Christian's lips. I forgive you. Three other words that should come just as quickly. I am sorry. See, being sorry, repentance, is that other side of the coin. It's the other part that makes breaching the breach possible. It never fails to astound me. How much turmoil has deep, deep roots? Anger, resentment, bitterness, hostility, brokenness can and do fester for weeks, months, years, decades, a lifetime. Wounds caused by a real or perceived injustice often do not heal or even scar over. They remain open wounds. Why? Well, you'd have to ask Freud for all of the reasons. But the most obvious reason is the lack of repentance and forgiveness. And they are missing. It makes it almost impossible to breach the breach. In 1970, I'm going back a while now, so I'm getting older, it's all right. In 1970, a really romantic movie came out. Love Story, based on the novel by Eric Siegel. It had everything. A rich, entitled, privileged young man falls in love with a working class girl. His parents disown him because of it, but he doesn't care. These young lovers try to make a go of it, and then ultimately she gets sick and dies in his arms. Oh my, it is a two boxes of Kleenex movie. It's been out almost 50 years, and it still ranks on the American Film Institute's most romantic movie list. It still ranks number nine. And on the Film Institute's 100 years, 100 quotes list, it has a quote ranked number 13. I'm guessing that anyone even close to my age still knows that quote because it was emblazoned on T-shirts and embroidered on, on throw pillows and, and put on the wooden things you get at home goods to put on your shelf and your mantle. It was everywhere. Right? Bill's way younger than me, and he's over here nodding. You know? <laughs> he just loves romantic news. He doesn't remember. I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to ask you for it. It's all right. Here it is, all right? Love means never having to say you're sorry. Love means never having to say you're sorry. Oh, oh. so romantic. <laughs> so wrong. I 
tell every couple preparing for marriage, if you are not ready to say, I am sorry, then you are not ready to be married. If anything, the more we love, the more we apologize. Not because we hurt others more when we love, but because love helps us with the four steps of genuine apology. And what are those steps? Well, first, we have to be aware. We have to be aware that we have hurt someone. If we don't know that we've done something, then we don't know to apologize. I have a friend who regularly likes to say to his wife, I'm sorry. And when she says, for what? He says, I don't know. But I know there's got to be something, and I just want to get out in front of it. <laughs> and then he laughs. Well, that's only half a joke. Because the truth is, we often hurt without knowing it. But the more we love, the more aware, the more sensitive, the more attuned we are to others' feelings. The second step then is regret. First we have to be aware, but then we have to care. Do you care that you have hurt another? Again, love opens our hearts to truly experience that regret. The third step is apology, to confess it. We're aware of it, we regret it, we confess it. Uh, love means never having to say you're sorry. Ah! Where were the censors? Who allows that kind of nonsense to be perpetrated on the public? We should absolutely confess. Absolutely. Share it. And then, of course, the fourth step is commitment to change. I mean, it's, it's right and good and healthy and appropriate to say, I'm sorry, but that should come with a commitment not to do it again. See, apology is so important, but, but we struggle with it. I, I, know just, uh, you know, I know just how hard it can be to forgive. And that, that's made harder when there's no genuine apology with it. For me, I, I find it a thousand times easier to forgive when there's genuine apology rather than when there's no remorse at all. In fact, I find it difficult not to forgive when there's genuine apology. And yet, as important as it is, as hard as it is to forgive, we find it equally hard to say, I'm sorry. And even when we do, we don't tend to be very good at it. You know, I think about the child who has done something inappropriate, you know, and then the parents say, that's wrong, you shouldn't do that. Say, I'm sorry. You know, and then the kid looks at his or her feet, mutters, sorry. They're obedient at least, but maybe not repentant. But, but adults are not much better. Instead of saying, I am sorry that I hurt you, we say, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Instead of saying, I'm sorry that my words cut you, we say, I'm sorry you misunderstood my words and took them the wrong way. Instead of saying, I'm sorry my actions hurt you, we say, well, I'm sorry, but. But you made me. But you had it coming. But you do the same thing to me. But I was in a bad mood, so I'm not responsible. Does it feel like maybe I'm starting to step on some toes? I'm sorry. You're so sensitive. Somehow, 
in our apology, we put the onus on the other. We make it their problem. We make it their fault. Or at the very least, we offer self-serving excuses undoing our apology. And the truth is, we do the same thing when we confess to God. We say to God, yes, we sinned, but then we give all the reasons why, as if that excuses it, and then imply, and the thing is, they're not really that big, certainly not as big as those who really do need to confess. You see, an insincere apology or confession is not apology or confession at all. It's when we own our actions, when we take responsibility for our words and our actions. that genuine healing can come and the breach can be breached. Now I'm spending a long time on this because forgiveness and repentance are central to good relationships. They are essential if we are going fulfill our calling in Colossians to bear with one another. I mean, Paul says, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And you would think if, if we did just that, then things would be all right. But Paul goes on to say, and bear with one another. Because Paul knew, Paul understood that even in the best of circumstances, in the strongest friendships, in the most loving marriages, in the most unified churches, in the, in the greatest neighborhoods, even in the best of circumstances, we do say and do things that hurt others. And if we're going to breach the breach, then we're going to have to bear with each other, and we're going to have to repent, and we're going to have to forgive. The gospel says, just as the Lord forgives you, you must also forgive. And it teaches us to repent, to turn in a different direction turn around, to commit to not do it again. Six words that are essential to every and all relationships. I am sorry and I forgive you. So my word on civility, I'm going to stick with Paul. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Bear with one another, repenting and forgiving. To which Paul adds, and most of all, clothe yourselves in love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Indeed, we are living in a very uncivil time. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, breach the breach. May God be with us. Amen.